My name is Pranay Dutta. I'm 16 years old, and I believe we're living in a dystopia. A dystopia without the neon lights and synth-heavy soundtracks that we're used to seeing in movies, but a dystopia that's nonetheless dangerous and despotic. Why do I think this? Well, I have three reasons. My first reason is that we're living under the most surveillance in the history of the world. Surveillance on and offline. Surveillance that endangers our freedoms. And I'm pretty sure everyone's well aware of offline surveillance, things like security cameras and the like. But online surveillance is even more prevalent, and it's less talked about and less understood. So how does online surveillance work? Well, most websites on the internet use a behavior tracker like Google Analytics. What Google Analytics does is it essentially sends data like where you move your mouse or where you click on a website back to Google and the company that is running that website. And this allows those companies to study or sell that data. This type of data is called data exhaust. And it's called data exhaust because it's like the exhaust of a car. It's something that's just naturally produced as we go about our daily lives. But it's dangerous in large quantities. So why do companies collect it? Why is it valuable? Well, it's because this sort of data can allow companies to generate insights. It's honest data. People really do click on things that they want to click on. People really do Google search things that they want to know about. And people will put much more personal information into a Google search bar than they will reveal to friends and relatives. Say, for example, signs your spouse is cheating on you, a search like that. It's a very personal search. And it's something that you probably wouldn't even tell to your friends or close relatives. But this is information that people give to Google all the time. So what can companies do with this? Companies run sophisticated machine learning algorithms and are able to predict things and to personalize services to people. And this is where the danger comes in. Because as much as we know how to create machine learning models and how the mathematics of that works, after we train these models and have them predict stuff, we don't actually understand what they're basing their predictions on. And this is just because we as humans have fundamental limitations onto our pattern recognizing abilities. Limitations that machines don't have. Another type of data analysis tool that is used by big companies and websites is A-B testing. Essentially, A-B testing divides the user base of a of an app or website into multiple groups, let's say A and B. And it shows group A one version of a website, and it shows group B another version. And these versions are very similar with maybe one small change, like a button here or a font change there, but identical all the way through. And these two versions are then measured with metrics like how long people stay on a website and stuff. And this type of small testing is able to make people stay on websites much longer than normal and essentially can change users' behaviors to how companies see fit. A good example of how powerful this type of data analysis is is a good Facebook study done and published in Nature Journal. Essentially what they did was they applied A-B testing to the context of an election. For group A, they kept the website as normal. And for group B, um, on people's friends' pages, they showed small I voted badge. Essentially, this would indicate to the person that that person voted. And this made group B much more likely to go out and vote in the election. This is very powerful. This allows large internet companies to manipulate the behavior of users and affect real life scenarios. This is what led MIT Technology Review to call Facebook the real presidential swing state. My second reason is that there's going to be a new wave of automation that comes, and it's going to affect wealth inequality. McKinsey and Company posits that about 50% of tasks that make up all the jobs in the world today are already currently automatable just by adapting current technologies. Additionally, six out of 10 jobs in the world today are made up of more than 30% of automatable tasks. There's a lot of jobs that can be automated. AI 
expert and author Kaifu Lee predicts something similar. He predicts that 40% of jobs in a 15 to 25 year time frame will be affected. It's a lot of jobs. And there's, it's gonna cause a lot of social upheaval and a lot of unpredictability. But we can say for sure that this is going to disproportionately affect low income workers. This is because low income workers typically work more automatable jobs. And the wealthy are going to get more productivity by paying less people. So additionally, AI companies are going to get more data and have these data moats that make the company even more difficult to compete against. Large companies like Facebook and Google are gonna be able to make great AI products because of the amount of data they have and startups and smaller companies won't be able to compete. This type of wealth inequality in both money and data is going to polarize our society even more. And the wealth gap is going to increase even more. My third reason is widespread distraction. In Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, the population of people who live in this world were distracted. They were happy and they were drugged. And they didn't realize that they were being bombarded with propaganda and living in a dystopia. We live in a world like that today. I'm sure you've seen the headlines that uh, humans' current uh, attention span are less than that of a goldfish. And I'm sure you've seen the claims that that's false. Regardless of how long human attention spans really are, I think we live in a time where it's the easiest thing in the world to make a habit out of getting distracted, intentionally or not. Let's say you're writing an essay or you're doing a job, or say, writing a TEDx speech, and you get a notification on your phone. After this, you go on a spiral of apps and Twitter and all sorts of things, and you suddenly, eight minutes has gone by. This is very common and a frequent occurrence, and it leads to doing what Cal Newport in his book, Deep Work, calls shallow work. It's work that's characterized by being unfocused and with distraction just cluttered among the time that you're actually doing work. This leads to just generally bad results. Results like worse grades than if you would have focused or fewer promotions. So we're living in a world where we're under a lot of surveillance, a, a lot of automation is gonna come soon and make our world even more unequal in terms of wealth and often we're too distracted to even notice. This makes me think that we're living in a dystopia, but the world doesn't have to be this way. And there's ways that society can change. And I'd like to offer a few solutions, both short-term and long-term, that I think could fix our society. For short-term solutions, I would like to first recommend some software that will keep you safer on the internet. For a web browser, I would recommend using Firefox. Firefox is the only major web browser that is 100% open source, and it's run by a nonprofit, the Mozilla Foundation. It's likely that you're using Chrome or Safari, but both of those work pretty much identical to Firefox, so it'll be easy to transition. I would recommend also to not just use stock Firefox, but to use it with some add-ons, namely Ad Nauseum and Privacy Badger. Ad nauseum is a ad block with a twist. It's, it, it does block ads, but it also simulates clicking on every single ad in the background. This sends mixed signals to the machine learning algorithms on the other side, and this makes it impossible for them to profile you and your preferences. This makes the data exhaust that they gather useless. And Privacy Badger is a third-party scripts blocker. Essentially, it blocks things like Google Analytics from ever running on any web page you visit. This will make your web browsing experience much better and safer. For a search engine, I would recommend using DuckDuckGo. You probably already use Google, right? But DuckDuckGo is just as easy to use 
and it by default respects your privacy. And all you have to do is go into settings and change the default browser from Google to DuckDuckGo. Finally, I would like to recommend Linux as a operating system, a Linux distribution. Switching from Windows or OS X may be hard, but I highly recommend it. And I'd recommend something like Ubuntu or Elementary OS. These are operating systems that are 100% open source, unlike their proprietary counterparts. And they are more efficient, and they can do everything that the, their counterparts can do. For the long term, I would, I would recommend supporting movements like the free and open source software movement. Free and open source software is software that respects your freedoms. And this is free as in freedom, right? Software that you can read the source code of. Software that you can trust because you can read the source code of it. You can't always trust proprietary source code, or proprietary code because you're never actually given the source code. Companies can promise you one thing and deliver something else. So to ever trust your code and to be secure, free software is the way to go. Another type of software that I think needs more adoption is encryption. Encryption is something that's heavily vilified by governments all over. And in fact, exporting crypto cryptographic algorithms was banned until 1992 uh, in America. And there's still restrictions on it. But encryption is something that can highly enhance our freedoms. It's something that protects all of us. And governments hate it so much that they even go out of their way to promote bad encryption standards. A good example is the NSA Clipper chip. It was a chipset that was promoted by the NSA that was said to secure voice and data channels, but in fact, it had a backdoor for the NSA so they could unethically spy on US citizens. And this chipset was never actually adopted, but if it was, it would be a privacy disaster for millions. And essentially, if someone was able to find that backdoor, they could spy on every American. Encryption is something that's important, and it's not just something criminals use. It's something that all of us can use to enhance our privacy. And finally, to thrive in a distracted world, you need the ability to focus, to do deep work, as Cal Newport puts it. It's the ability to focus on cognitively demanding tasks for long enough to accomplish something. Uh, a good example is a personal experience I had while writing this talk. During the initial research phase, I went out, checked out books from the library, and just sat down with a pencil and paper and took notes. And while I was doing this, I noticed I was getting distracted by my phone. So I turned off my phone and put it away every time I was getting ready to work on this project. This improved my productivity tenfold, and I actually accomplished something. I wasn't just getting distracted every 10 minutes or so. So finally, I would ask you this. Please spread the word. Spread the current problems that we have, the current solutions that we have. And I'd like to leave you with one last thing. One of the most common and dangerous attributes of a dystopia is people in a dystopia don't always realize that they're in one. Thank you very much.